Hey guys, Spibs here, and welcome to the very first episode of the series. In this series, we're going to focus on the new electricity system in Rust. Electricity was released in December 2018, and since then has received some minor tweaks and fixes from the devs. Although it's only been a month and a half, the community has quickly taken it on board and created some amazing contraptions. However, not everyone has adopted the new features and many others haven't had the confidence to create something unique or even touch it at all. So this series is focused on helping people gain the upper hand when it comes to electricity. The end goal is to provide enough information to everyone that watches it that they can have enough independence to either create their own circuits or repurpose someone else's design, much like base building. Firstly, we're just going to have a look at some of the basic components that they've implemented into the electricity system. No matter what you're doing, you're going to need the wire tool. This enables you to connect all the components together and actually get them working. So I'm going to use this wire tool to connect the second solar panel to the component that I have on the wall here, which is called a root combiner doesn't get much more simple than this. All the root combiner does is combine two power sources and outputs them into one. Very, very simple. So you can see here we have a combined power out of 40 units of power. Each solar panel, since they're facing the sun, is providing the maximum amount of power, which at this point in time is 20. The root combiner itself doesn't require any power, so we don't have any line loss when we're using the root combiner. So therefore, what we're putting in is exactly what we're getting out. Other components, however, will require usually about one unit of power. The next component we're going to look at is the electrical branch. I'm going to place it on the wall here. I'm going to use my wire tool to go from the combined power out to the power in of the electrical branch. What this allows us to do is split the power source into two different channels. So we have a branch out and a power out. Now this is pretty simple. So the electrical branch is receiving 40 units of power. It uses one unit of power and then we have left over 39 units of power. If we want to divert a specific amount, let's say eight units of power, we set that and that is what's going to come out of the branch. No more and no less unless the power, of course, isn't being supplied. So the rest of the power, however, the 31 units of power that's left over out of the 39 is going to automatically come out of the power out. Now the one thing to keep in mind with the electrical branch is the branch out socket is the priority automatically. You can't change this. So that means if the power drops, so let's replicate that by disconnecting one of the solar panels by right clicking and holding. Right, the combined power out is now 20. It comes into the electrical branch, providing it with 20 units of power. The power out is now going to be 19 minus the 8 that we're branching out, provided that the branch out is actually connected to something. So, like I said, it prioritizes the branch out. That's always something to keep in mind. And later on in the series, this will become a little bit handy knowing this information to be able to control circuits in certain ways. So now that we have some basic knowledge about what a root combiner is and what an electrical branch is, we're going to have a look at two more components. The first is a counter. Now, this actually has two main functionalities. It can either act as a counter or it can display what's called pass-through, which I'll explain in just a moment. The next component is what's called a splitter. I'm going to place that on the wall here 
and we're going to come back to that in a moment as well. I'm going to get my wire tool and I'm going to connect the branch out to the power in of the counter. Now the counter by default is set to the counter function. We're going to set it to the pass through function just so we can get some visual representation of what's going on. So hold down E on the counter and set it to show pass through. Now pass through is the amount of power that is going to pass through to the next device that's connected to it. Now you might be a little bit confused because it's displaying the number 7 and we set this to output 8. The reason that that's happening is the display itself is using one unit power and like I said it's displaying the pass through that's going to be connected to the next device. So the next device is actually only going to receive 7 units of power. So keep that in mind if you're designing any particular circuits. Before we move on, there's one more aspect of the counter that I want to talk about, and that is the actual counter function of it. Now, there's two things you have to do. You have to set the target, which I've just set to five, and then you have to have something triggering the counter itself. Now, I've got these three timers set up. I've set them all to one, so when I activate them, they automatically switch off a second later. This is just simpler in this particular demo than using the manual switches. Uh, it just saves me a little bit of time. So as you can see, this timer here is connected to the increment counter. The next timer in the middle here is connected to the decrement. And then this one is set to the clear. So if I activate this one, it adds one. If I do it again, then it goes up to two. Now when it reaches five, it then allows this power to then pass through and power what is ever next in the circuit. But if I clear the counter, then it just simply goes back down to zero. Or if I take this up to two and then use the decrement, takes away one unit. So it's pretty simple how it works. Now you wouldn't normally have these timers hooked up to the actual counter itself. You might have a laser or a pressure pad or something like that, um, which there will be examples of probably later on in the series. But I just wanted to explain this. So let me show you, like I said, I set the target to five. So when we reach that, it then allows the power to pass through. If we then cleared, then it resets it all again. Pretty simple. Let's move on. What we're going to do now is have a look at the splitter. So we've diverted eight units of power through the branch out to this display. We're going to divert the rest of the power, which should be 31, to the power in of this splitter. So the power in to the splitter is displaying 31. The splitter itself is going to use one unit of power and therefore leaving 30 units of power to split between these three power outs. Now the way that it works is if only one or two of the power outs are in use, it will split the total amount of power automatically between those two. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to use these three displays I'm going to set them to show the pass-through and I'm going to connect them one by one now watch very carefully what happens to the pass-through when I connect all of them in series so this is displaying an output of 29 the counter itself just like in this example, is using one unit of power. So it's the 30 that's getting outputted, minus one, which is of course going to pass through 29 to the next bit of the circuit. So watch what happens. When I connect the next one, it automatically adjusts what is going to that first display by what is connected to the power out. It will divide it by two. 
So now there is 30 being shared between these two outputs. Both displays are using one each, leaving a total of 28 and therefore passing through 14 each. Now the same will happen once I connect this third display. So each counter is using one unit of power each and then they will pass through nine units of power each adding up to 27 plus the three that they're using totaling the 30. Now the main difference to keep in mind with the splitter as handy as it is is you can't program a certain amount to go out a particular output. It is an automatic output based on how many power outs you're using. That is where the branch in some circuits, especially if you don't have all that much power in your base, can be a lot more handy. But we'll have a look at that a little bit later. The next components that we're going to have a look at are switches. Now there's two main switches in the game at the moment. The first one is a basic on-off switch very similar to light switches that you have in your house. Now I've hooked it up to a light to simulate the same thing. It really doesn't get any more simple than this. You simply switch it on, providing it's hooked up to a power source, the light comes on. Amazing. You switch it off and just as amazingly it switches the light off. Now I know this perhaps comes across as condescending in the way that I'm talking, but I really wanted to make sure that I cover all basics and at least has a, have a visual representation of what's going on when certain things happen, just so it's easier to understand when we go into a little bit more complicated stuff. The next switch that we're going to have a look at is a timer. Now, if you hold down E, providing it's got power going to it, you can set the time that you want the timer to have the duration for. Now, automatically it's set to 10 seconds. We can set it to a shorter amount of time. I'm going to set it to 5 and then click set duration. We then can activate it. The light comes on, the timer goes around, and when it expires, it automatically turns off. Now, is there usefulness for this? With a light, by itself, maybe not so much, but if you calculated the amount of time at night time, uh, say it lasts for 10 minutes, then 600 seconds would be the program for it. You switch it on, and then in the morning, it automatically switches off. Now, is this the best way to do it? By far, definitely not, but it at least gives you a little bit of understanding about how to use this switch. While we're looking at switches, specifically the timer, there's one more feature that we need to go over. This is the toggle on feature. Now for this to work, there still needs to be power flowing into the electrical input. What we're going to do, we're going to hook this up, we're going to go into the laser that I've already mounted on the wall here, I'm going to supply power to the laser as well, And now we can see a laser beam across here. So at this point in time, the lasers have a range of about one and a half squares. So if I'm here and I'm breaking the laser, it won't really do anything. If I move a bit closer, I get the same result. But if I'm about one and a half squares away and I pass through the laser beam, I will activate the timer here. It'll last for about five seconds, it'll go back off, and I can activate it again by passing through the laser. I'm going to do the same with the pressure pad. So I'll give the pressure pad a little bit of power, go into the power in, and I'll take power out, and go into the toggle on here. So of course, I'm sure you've already guessed the result here. All I'm going to do is pass over the pressure pad, the light will come on for the 5 second duration, and then it will turn off. Simple. 
just note that even though I'm still actually on the pressure pad, it's not going to automatically toggle the light again. I have to move off the pressure pad, back onto it, and therefore it will toggle it again. The last component that we're going to take a look at is the door controller. This is a very simple component, but there's multiple ways to connect it. We're going to look at a very simple way, but later on in the series, we're going to look at different ways you can use door controllers. But for now, we'll just hook it up and show you how to connect it. So, you place your door controller on your door frame. Now, since there's no door, I can't pair it to anything. I'm going to place my door here. I'm going to place a code lock on it and lock it. Now, the mistake that I've made here is that even though I have access to the code lock, it won't allow me to pair the door. So I need to unlock the door, press E when it prompts me to pair the door, and then lock the code lock again. Now, this will remain paired as long as the door stays. If I took off this door and put a new one back on, or if it got blown off, then I need to repair the door controller. All I'm going to do now is connect the door controller to a switch that I've already set up and powered over here. And now, all we have to do is flick the switch on and the door opens. It's as simple as that. Now, like I mentioned, this isn't necessarily the best way to control the door. Something to keep in mind is for people to use any switches in your base, they actually don't need TC access. So having a switch like this that controls a door, especially if it's perhaps the front door or a loot room or something like that, like I've seen in other videos, isn't really the best option. Now, I have come up with a potential solution, but we'll go over that once we have a little bit more understanding and a little bit more experience with electricity. For now, this will do. So that's going to be the end of episode one. In episode two, we're going to have a look at logic gates, memory cells, and blockers, and that should be out within a few days. If you have any questions or feedback about this episode, however, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. If you didn't like the video, hit that dislike button, but if you did like it, smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. You can also follow me on Twitter for the latest updates, the links will be in the description, and any links that I did mention in this video will also be there. Until then, we'll see you in the next one, take care guys.